Hey, welcome to Compass. Our mission is navigating people to God. So glad that you're here. I want to welcome those of you that are watching online today. And if you're new to Compass, we're just honored that you're here and you're worshiping with us today. And happy Groundhog Day, right? Today is Groundhog Day. And I'm told that Puxatani Phil did not see his shadow. So great news that this long, cold, bitter winter is over. <laughs> and we can all take a deep breath and just enjoy the spring that's to come. So that's good. And today is Super Bowl Sunday. I think Sam mentioned that. How many of you are rooting for the Chiefs today? Any Chiefs fans? All right. Yeah. How many for the 49ers? All right. Yeah. Stand your ground there. I like that. Uh, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but I, I believe that in my quiet time uh, this week, I received a word from the Lord about the Super Bowl. It was uh, from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, and it says, And when the chief shepherd appears, <laughs> you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And this is uh, Super Bowl 54, so 1 Peter 5, 4. <laughs> so clearly, straight from the Word of God, the Chiefs will beat the 49ers today in the Super Bowl. Please do not place any bets about that. Uh, <laughs> Well, last week we kicked off a brand new series. I want to thank my, my great friend Brandon Beard for doing an amazing job last week. Proud of Brandon and did a great job as we started Dark Horses. And by definition, Dark Horses are little known people unlikely to succeed who ultimately accomplish great things. And we said that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And Brandon taught us about Nehemiah and that when he set out on his leadership adventure, he, what's the first thing he did? He prayed. He prayed. So how's that going for you? We, we started 21 days of prayer. H have you stayed the course? I won't ask for a show of hands. I won't embarrass you, but you should be in day seven. Let's all do this together. Come on, church. Let's do this together. Let's pray together. And uh, if you haven't started yet, it's okay. Go to mycompasschurch.com. That first icon there on the left you'll see is 21 days of prayer. Click on that. You can catch up. And I'm praying for you because inside all of us is a little something that just kind of hopes and maybe dreams that God could do something great through us one day. And the more we read Scripture, the more it becomes abundantly clear that God always does his greatest work. He does his greatest work through the most unlikely of people. And these people we're looking at each week, Nehemiah and Noah and Daniel and Esther and Gideon. We get to, I get to teach about Gideon next week. If we aren't careful, we'll miss why these people are dark horses, why they're long shots, because we've kind of been programmed to think that these were special people who had a direct line to God and they were special men and women of courage that have a level of courage that you and I could never achieve and that their response and their interaction with God was at so much a different higher level than we could ever have. And that's where we usually land because we think of them as Bible superheroes. We kind of sort of project them up on a pedestal and the truth is that's just not the case. They were ordinary people just like you and I, and that's, that's the truth. And we'll notice that in every dark horse story, there's always obstacles and excuses that people have to overcome. And when it comes to your life and my life, uh, what you are wanting to accomplish, all of us have a laundry list of excuses, all of us. And until we learn to overcome our excuses, do you understand this? And this is hard for some of us to hear, but I'll say it. Do you understand that it's possible to be a Christian and get to the end of your life realizing that you've kind of wasted your life here on earth. Not only possible, it's probable if you don't let go of your excuses. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for anyone here, anyone who's watching online. I don't want them to get to the end of our lives and say, hey, it's kind of been a waste. And you don't want that for you either. And, and the reality is that some of us, unless we get over this, we get to the end of our life and sure, We'll check off the saved box. We've, we've made Jesus our Lord and Savior. We accepted him. We're baptized. But the significance box, did we live a life of significance for Jesus? Did we do that? Did we, did we fulfill God's purposes for our life in our time? Will we be able to check that box? Because the gap between saved and significant, there is a canyon that is filled with our excuses. And let me just say this. Excuses can be the tool used to build a life of nothingness. They can. I don't say that to discourage you. I say that because I hope at the end of this message today that each of us would begin to live a life that would have us checking off that significance box very soon. And we will study a man in scripture who had very little to offer but did arguably more than anyone else. And seriously, I would submit to you, no one 
in Scripture had more excuses to put before God than this man we're going to study today, Moses, Moses. And we're going to look in Exodus chapter 2, and we'll land in chapters 3 and 4. And I want to show you the story behind the story of this man, Moses, a man of incredible insecurity, a very reluctant leader, and yet in the midst of all his excuses, God speaks something into his life that you and I need to hear. We pick it up at the end of Exodus chapter 2. The Israelites are groaning in their slavery and they cry out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. That's a big moment. Israel has been in slavery for 40 years. They had no memory of freedom. The children, the younger generation, all they knew was slavery. All they knew was oppression. And they cry out and their help would come from a very unlikely source. Moses is going to be the agent of deliverance for the children of Israel. He is going to help free one million people out of slavery and lead a transformation for an entire nation. And understanding the backstory is very critical. We begin with a desert season in the, in the life of Moses. Literally, he's in the desert tending sheep. He's a shepherd. And he has been forced into this life because of some mistakes of his past. He's a fugitive of the law. He's on the run now. And he is primarily running from the Egyptian leader, Pharaoh. And again, his people are under oppression. They're dying. They're, they're uh, being murdered on a regular basis. They become cheap slave labor. And in the midst of this, I mean, we don't know what Moses was thinking. I, I don't know. We don't know if he w- had a concern about this. We assume he did. But we know this. It was a concern to God. And Moses is herding sheep in the wilderness. And one day in the midst of this, he sees a bush that is burning, but it's not burning up. And God speaks to him from the bush. That, that's what I said. He speaks. Can you imagine him? <laughs> Moses? I've said this going back to the shepherd's quarters that night. What would you do today, Moses? Oh, no big deal. God talked to me through a burning bush. Sure he did, Moses. Sure he did. We think you've been burning some bush, right? <laughs> Why would God do that? Why would he speak through a bush, a burning bush? Why not just speak out of the sky? Why not have a sheep come over and he could talk to the sheep or something? God appears in the form of flames, of fire. He's trying to get Moses' attention. And the first words out of God's mouth, he says, Moses... I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's kind of an odd greeting, if you will. Like if you were to meet me for the very first time and tell me your name, and I would say, hi, I'm the father of Hannah, and the father of Landon, and the father of Luke, and the grandfather of Henry. That might seem a little strange to you, right? But but, And here's God, and, and what is he saying? He's saying this, I'm a God of the people. I'm a God who loves people. I care about people. I think that's significant. And you would think that that would be just this sense of relief for Moses. But the Bible says that at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Some superhero, right? We get the sense, don't we, that when we read the Bible, we think that these these characters are supernatural. He's Moses. He's Bible guy. He's Charlton Heston with chiseled features. If you're over 40, you had to be thinking about Charlton Heston, right? If you're under 40, forget it. It's not important. But here's the deal. His beard is swaying in the wind. He's on the cliff. It's majestic. He's got a staff in his hand. His voice sounds like James Earl Jones, you know. He's Moses. He's Bible guy. We think these Bible guys are fearless, but they're not. Moses is scared. He's hiding his face, scared. He's shaking in his sandals, scared. And the Lord says, Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering. So, four words, I have come down to rescue them. High drama. It's a big moment. You would think this would just fill Moses with adrenaline. He'd seen the struggles. If you go back earlier in the book, he watched an Egyptian beat a Hebrew man, and he was so angry that he killed the Egyptian. He murdered him. He He had seen the people die, the children die. He couldn't stand the injustice. He couldn't stand it anymore. Now here's God saying, I'm going to come down to rescue them. And you'd think that Moses would be like, yes, get them, sick them, God. Let's do this. You and me together. I mean, let's get them. I mean, don't you ever feel like that sometimes? Wouldn't you like to see God come down and take out all the injustice in the world? I think about that kind of stuff. Watch what he says to Moses. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, 
out of Egypt. And again, we think of Moses as a superhero. We're like, he says, verily, verily, whatever thou sayest, O Jehovah, I shall go. Yes, I shall go right now. I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I think the dialogue that's to come would indicate that he was a bit disappointed. I think it was more like, wait a minute, you said you was coming down, you know, that kind of thing. That's probably the reality. You, 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 what says you go business? You said you were coming down. But God said, no, Moses, you go. Write this down if you're taking notes. You are God's answer. You are God's answer. The same thing God told Moses, God is telling you. You are God's answer. Moses going was God coming down. Moses going was the way God planned it. The answer to the dilemma for your family and your school and your community is not somebody else. You are God's answer. And he's asking you to do the very same thing that he asked Moses. He wants you to navigate people to God. When he asks you to speak, when he asks you to pray, when he asks you to lead, you must realize that you are God's answer. And so what does our fearless hero Moses do upon hearing that he is going to be used by God for a significant purpose? Well, for the next two chapters, Moses launches into not one, not two, not three, not four, but five excuses that he puts before God. And he is painfully reluctant to be part of God's plan. So I want to cover those five excuses in the next few moments. And his reluctance, by the way, does not make him a bad leader. I think there's a you know, I want to make an observation that I don't think every great leader is, 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 is not reluctant. I think sometimes great leaders are reluctant. I don't think they're all spur-of-the-moment thinkers. But even if they are, your reluctance doesn't scare God. It doesn't scare God, okay? And I want, to, I want you to listen to the five excuses of Moses, and in the process, we'll discover some of the common excuses that keep us from being used by God. Uh, first, first thing, Moses says to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses says, who am I? Excuse number one, it's an identity problem. It's an identity excuse. Okay, I'm a nobody. I can't do this, God. I'm not good enough. I'm not, many, many of us, we're like this. We have an identity problem. Listen to God's response. He says, I will be with you, Moses. I will be with you. And when we know that God is with us, we can do anything. I, don't, I think some of you know this. A couple years ago, I was asked to represent our, kind of our tribe of churches, the non-denominational independent Christian churches. If you're not really, if you're kind of new to Compass, we're, we're, we're non-denominational, but we're part of a, a movement of independent Christian churches. And I was asked to lead a national convention. It's kind of a, a big honor to do it. I was the president of this convention for a whole year. And so when it came time, June of 18, to do this, uh, I was fired up and excited until I got there that opening night. And then I was scared to death. And I looked up there, and I was supposed to speak first, and then Chris Hodges was supposed to speak right behind me, after me. And I don't know if you know Chris Hodges, but he basically pastors the largest church in America, like 50,000 people in the church, bigger than most cities, you know, and just, just a big church. And, and I, I got in there in the green room, and I saw Chris Hodges, and I got a little psyched out, and I'm just thinking, I don't belong here, and one of these things is not like the other, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I was just, like, scared out of my mind. I didn't know what to do. And Chris is like, hey, man, you okay? And I'm like... I'm really nervous. I don't know if I can do this. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing here. I should have got somebody else to do this, you know, and all this. And he's like, you're going to be fine. He goes, man, let me pray for you. So he prays this amazing prayer. It's like, you know, just he prays a prayer that you would envision a guy who's the pastor of the largest church in America pray. It was just an amazing prayer. <laughs> and and I, I literally, I felt so calm and so relaxed afterward. I was just so, I felt so much better. I really felt like the Lord was with me. And I got up there and I don't remember much about the next 30 minutes, but People laughed and people clapped and I think it went decent and everything and, and I got done and I was like, Shh, I was just glad it was over and I got off the stage and went in the green room and I think Chris was just trying to encourage me but he looked at me and he goes, man, thanks a lot. And I'm like, what? And he's like, that was amazing. How am I going to follow that? And I'm like, you know, I'll pray for you, man. I really will. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't want to be in your spot, you know. Uh, I mean, I get to the, I get, I, I come around out of the green room and I go sit down on the, on the first uh, row and my wife's there and she's like, hey, great job, babe. And I'm like, I know, let's pray for Chris. I mean, it's going to be tough, you know. <laughs> but no, seriously, I, I, I felt the presence of God. I felt the Holy Spirit of God with me. This is the way it's supposed to be. Think about Jesus at the end of his life, before he ascends, he gives us the great commission. He's like, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them everything that I have commanded you. And then he says this. What does he say? And surely I am what? 
I'm with you always to the end of the age. When God is with you, it depends less on you than you can ever imagine. It's God working through you. And you would think that our Bible guy, Moses, upon learning that the God of all heaven is with him, would say, yes, God, you're going to go with me. You and I, we're unbeatable, the two of us together. It's going to be awesome. Nope, another excuse. Excuse number two, here it comes. Well, suppose I go to the Israelites, what shall I tell them? What do I tell them? Insecurity is the excuse, number two. I'm not qualified. What if I ask a stupid question? What if I don't know how to answer the questions that they have? I'm not qualified. I don't know enough. We use this a lot. I would suppose this is why many of us stay on the sidelines and and decide not to serve Jesus or share Jesus. We're so worried about not knowing enough. We're, we're worried about not looking competent. We're worried that we don't know the Bible enough. It's a sad moment when insecurity keeps us from doing the thing that God wants for us. And that's exactly how Moses felt. And God looks at him and says, this is what you're to tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Is that big enough for you, Moses? I am the great I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who spoke the world into existence, breathed life into man. I am going to be, I am sending you. That's the person who is sending you. And you would think again that this would just give Moses an enormous amount of confidence that he'd come out of this thing and that, yeah, you're going to be with me. You're going to be, you're be by my side. I come with all the authority of God in heaven. This is going to be awesome. But nope, another excuse. Well, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? You know, the part of Moses should never have been played by Charlton Heston. It should have been played by Martin Short. <laughs> right? <laughs> what if no one listens? What? It influences excuse number three. People won't respect me. They won't respect me. Moses had a past. He had some failures on his resume. He had some scars. Remember, he had murdered someone. So he thought, people will bring that up and discredit me. Some of, some of us struggle with that same thing. I have a past. I hear that all the time. Pastor, you don't, you don't know much about my life. You don't know what I've done. Uh, I, don't know that, I don't see God ever forgiving me. I hear that all the time. Some people never get over that. It's a good way, a segue to number four. He says, okay, Lord, well, what if, I've never been eloquent. I'm, I'm slow of speech and tongue. The message says it real well. It says, I don't talk well. I've never been good with words. I stutter and sam- stammer, <laughs> just like I just did right there. Yep. <laughs> me and Moses, we got a lot in common. <laughs> but Moses gives me hope, amen? I mean, if he can do it, I can do it. And that, I, I just, you think of that and you're like, man, how can you be so in, 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 inadequate? That's the, fourth, that's the fourth excuse, inadequacy. He says, I'm not good enough at blank. I mean, you fill in the blank. When you feel God nudging you to do something, you'll always have something to fill in the blank. Maybe you're asked to serve at Compass, and inevitably, I, I'm not good enough with words. I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't have enough time. Kids make me nervous. I can't find a babysitter. My husband won't go for this. Just excuses. Moses said, I, I don't speak well, God. You don't want me. You want somebody else. And then God says this. Now go. It says, tell him again, go. I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. Now, I love this because if you study the Hebrew word, the Hebrew rendering just says, now go. I will be with your mouth. I will be with your mouth. I love that. I'll guide your lips. I'll be your mouthpiece. I'll tell you what to say. It's like you'll have an earpiece in. I'll just be telling you what to say. You just say what I tell you. And some of us on the sidelines that are waiting to feel fully equipped before we jump in, you'll be waiting a long time. I can't think of a role that I've stepped, to and stepped into in my life where I've felt 100% fully equipped. I can't think of a role. First time I ever preached a sermon, I remember the first time I ever preached a sermon in front of a group of people back in Indiana, and I remember preaching, and it was awful. It was just awful. And even, you know, even when I would ask somebody, hey, how was it? They're like, eh, I'm not going to lie. It was pretty bad, you know? <laughs> when I married Michelle, I had no clue what it meant to be a good husband. I'm still, still learning, okay? Michelle's still trying to teach me how to have, you know, good table manners and things like that after 33 years, Right? My first ministry, I had a children's ministry up in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and I, I had no idea what I was doing. I was a children's pastor, and I just used to pray, Lord, 
I just don't want to ruin these kids' lives. Please help me, right? Please help me. When I became a parent, anyone else, when you became a parent, did you feel 100% adequate? I had no idea how to be a parent, you know? And it's like, I'm just, I'm just Lord, I'm, I mean, I'm a sinner. My wife's a sinner. We have these little sinnerlings, you know? <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't have a clue what to do as a dad. And now I'm, I'm 53 and I'm a grand, and I'm an expert on parenting, but there's no kids in the house anymore, right? So that's the cruel thing about that. And uh, I remember, you know, you and I, we don't, we don't come hardwired to be God's messenger. I didn't have a clue. You've, I've told you my story on the day God called me, and I find myself in Bible college one morning, and I felt so ill-equipped to fulfill this newfound calling of mine. But I learned this over the years. God doesn't really call the equipped. He equips the called. He equips the called. He doesn't say, oh, you have it all together. Now we can use you. Come on in to the kingdom. So when are you going to get over your excuses? I love you guys. I do. Some of you, I've, I've been here 18 years, and I've seen some of you come in year after year after year, and you sit, and I'm sure you enjoy our church, and I know you, you love your church, but some of you, it, you've been sitting on the sidelines for that long. It's time to get in the game. Stop using those excuses. Moses had one final excuse. I don't even know if it's right to call it an excuse. It's kind, of, it's kind of different than an excuse, but I didn't know what to call it, so I coupled it with the excuses. But it's the only one that kind of irritates God, and you can understand. He says, Moses says, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else, right? Just, I mean, you ever feel that way with God? There are 7 billion people on the planet. Pick someone else. Move along, Lord. Nothing to see here. Right? Think about Compass. There's 6,000 people, four campuses. You're telling me you can't find anybody else? Come on, man. You're God. You, call my neighbor, okay? You know, call my coworker. You know, dump this on them. You can dump this on my spouse. Don't tell her I told you. She's great, but don't have me do it. And God says, no, no. I have something specific for you to do for me. I want to tell to those of you that are watching online, and we, we love our online community but I just want to encourage you. What can you do to serve at Compass? What could you do? What could you possibly do? Maybe you have resources that you can give to help us with our church. Maybe, maybe you can pray. Maybe you can be a prayer warrior. You should, you should log in right now and talk to our, one of our chat hosts and, or talk to Pastor Chris and talk about what can I do to serve Compass. You, you're online every weekend. You're benefiting from the worship and the teaching and all that. I want to encourage you with that. Maybe you're sitting in the audience here in Colleyville at our physical campus, and, and, and I would just encourage you in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to help me with something. Some of you could be helping in children's ministry or, or in student ministry or, 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 or be greeters or section hosts or first impressions or, or in guest gathering or security or working in the nursery with babies. What, you, ask, you should ask, what can we do? How, do, how, do we, how can we be the hands and feet of Jesus to our community? And maybe some of you need to go on a mission trip. You know, we have... This summer, we're going to go to the Dominican Republic. I just got back from the Dominican Republic. God's doing some amazing things uh, through Go Ministries down there. We're going to be working with them this summer. CM is going to be leading that group. There's a, there's a group that's going to Guatemala under the direction of Heidi Miller. Amazing team. We're going to go down to Guatemala and, and work with the children. And, and it's, it's an amazing ministry. Maybe you've never done anything like that. It's time to stop with the excuses. It's time to stop. And I'll, there's two ways you can do this today. Uh, real simple way, we, just, we try to make it as easy as we can for you, okay? We know you're busy. We know you got a lot going on, or at least you're pretending to be busy and pretending to have a lot going on, okay? So just text serve CV, serve CV, serve Colleyville, and this is the number, 817-968-1440. Or if you want to just connect right now, you can do that. You just put your name on this card that you were given when you came in. Give us your best contact number. We're simply going to follow up with you, get to know you a little bit, and try to figure out what it is that you can do for our church. We want to get as many people involved as we possibly can, because no matter what excuse you might have, whether it's just like Moses, identity, insecurity, influence, inadequacy, irrational, whatever those are, when God saved you, if you're a Christ follower, God put his spirit inside of you. That means he's with you. He's by your side. He'll be your mouthpiece. He'll tell you what to say. And I'm going to tell you, when God is with you, your excuses don't mean anything. They're worthless. Okay? When God is with you, your excuses are worthless. 
But that's not the only thing God was telling Moses. That right in the midst of all this, in all the midst of his reluctance and in the midst of his insecurity, there's a pretty transformative moment. God looks at Moses and he says to him, Moses, what is that in your hand? By the way, when God asks a question, it's never because he doesn't know the answer. It's for your benefit. And Moses is a shepherd. So he said, I have a staff here. God, I'm a shepherd. Remember, I have a, I have a sheep stick. I have a sheep stick in my hand. That's what I have. Sometimes, you know, the sheep, they wander around and they try to run away. And, and I'm required as a shepherd to poke them with the sheep stick and kind of say, go back, little sheep. You've got to get in line. And so that's, what Mo- that's how I envision Moses saying. <laughs> and... Uh, so he just says to God, God says, what do you have in your hand? He says, I just got this stupid stick. And I don't know if Moses felt inadequate at this point. I guess he did. He's 80 years old. He's kind of a sun-withered shepherd. He's been living out in the wilderness. He's a dark horse. And uh, I don't know what God's thinking at this moment. He's probably looking down going, I thought I had Charlton Heston. I got Martin Short. I don't know what to do here. But he looks at him and he says, what's in your hand? And it's a great question because we all have something in our hands. We all do. You have talents, you have abilities, you have resources, you have influence. And so I think the question that God would ask every single one of us is, what's in your hand? What is it that I have given you that you can use for my kingdom? Every talent, every dollar, every ability can be used to build up the family of God. And then God says something interesting to Moses. He says, now throw it on the ground. The thing that's in your hand, release it to the earth. Basically, God was saying, if you're wanting to understand this, my understanding of this passage is that he wanted Moses to take everything that he had and release it out of his control and lay it down on the earth to be used for God. And Moses throws down his staff, and if you've studied this, maybe in Sunday school or whatever, the staff becomes immediately alive, and it becomes a snake. And that's really odd to us, and we always just focus on, ooh, it's a snake. He's trying to scare Moses. God was not trying to scare Moses. In the Middle East, a snake would have represented power. And God was showing Moses, if you, just, if you take everything in your hands, maybe it's just a stick, but you release it for me, and there's power. It comes alive. And all of us have a choice with what God has given us in our hands, our identity, our income, our influence and impact on others, and we can keep it to ourselves, we can, that's one choice, we can hold on to it, or we can release it and let God use it. God's answer is you, always. Single or married, you have no kids, or if you have 10 kids, if you have 10 kids, we're gonna pray for you. Whether you're at the top of your organization, or you're just getting started, God's answer is you. And your abilities and your income and your influence are what's in your hand. And you will never, ever see God's power at work in your life until you release what's in your hand. You'll never see it. And then right after this, God asked him to do something kind of interesting. He says, now, you've thrown it down. Now put your hand inside your pocket or your cloak, what they would call a coat. And God is saying, Moses, I've... Everything I've given you, all that you have in your hand, put it inside your coat as if you're keeping it just for you and hide it from being used by me. Hide it from the community. Hide it from the church. Hide your income and your influence and your abilities. That's the metaphor here. And put it inside your coat. And then he says, I want you to pull it out. And when Moses pulled his hand out of his pocket... His skin became leprous, like a leper. It was white as snow. It was sick. It was diseased. I've always wondered, what what does that mean? What's God trying to tell Moses? Well, I think it means that when you keep all those things to yourself, ultimately, it's like a disease. It'll make you sick. If everything that you have in your hand, all your time, all your energy, all your money, all your talents, if you just spend that on you, ultimately, you're going to be miserable. You'll know your life isn't right. You'll have anxiety and a lack of contentment and strife and tension all around you because you've kept it all to yourself. And watch what God does next. He says, now, put it back in your coat, he said, and when he took it out the second time, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. 
So God was saying, when you use your gifts, all that I've given you, for my purposes, life gets restored again. What's in your hand is exactly what God wants to use now, and until you release it for God's purpose, you'll never, ever see it come alive again. So I'll ask you, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? Are you using it for God's purpose? Some of you, honestly, what's in your hand is a lot of resources. You're financially wealthy. God's given you the gift of making money. Now you have to understand the gift of giving. And until you learn to invest it in God's kingdom, you already know this. Money will make your marriage, it'll make your family, it'll make you sick. Eventually. Eventually. It'll ruin you. Some of you have vast levels of influence. Uh, Business owners, leaders in the marketplace, leaders at your workplace. You have a great opportunity to be an impact for Christ. Some of you, you have time to give. There's an empty nest. You have wisdom to give and you have time to give it. Come on, man. Stop using those excuses. No more excuses. Until you learn, God never, listen, did you notice? God never listened to one of his excuses. He had an answer for every one of his excuses. And until you learn to use your influence and your income uh, for, to further God's kingdom, not just your kingdom, you will never experience true victory in your life. Until you learn to get rid of all the excuses, there will always be part of you that will be withering away. So, again, I want to encourage you today. Okay? I love you. I care about you. I want you to text serve CV to this number and just see what happens if you're not involved. Some of you are. Some of you are doing three or four things. Okay? Some of these people that are doing three, four, and five things around our church would love for you to text right now. They would love to have a break. Okay? And some of you, amen. I got an amen down here. And some, some of you need to fill this out. And there's going to be buckets at every door. You can put this in. We're, we just want to start the conversation. That's all. We're not going to start tonight. Okay? You don't have to come down here and pray all through the Super Bowl or anything like that. Right? It, we're just going to start the conversation. You're a dark horse. So what? So am I. So is Moses. Moses said, I'm a nobody. You don't want me. God says, no, no, that's the beauty. I'm, I do. I'm going with you. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I'll tell you what to say. I'll be your mouthpiece. What if they don't believe me? <laughs> That's not your job. That's my job. I'll take care of that. I do all the transformation anyway. Send somebody else. Oh, no, Moses. Oh, no. For you, you are God's answer. And I want you to be able to check off that significance box real soon. Let me pray over you today. God, we love you. So grateful to get to speak today. I'm so thankful, so humbled that you would let me do this today. Um, You know my history. I'm a lot like Moses. So God, thank you. Thank you for this platform. And God, I just pray your blessing on everyone who was able to listen to this message today. I, I pray, God, that we would do everything we need to do to check off that significance box soon. We love you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys.